If you look in the east before sunrise, a brilliant white object can sometimes be seen, the morning star. This is the third brightest natural object in the sky after the sun and the moon. At other occasions, the same brilliant white object will appear in the western sky after sunset when it's called the evening star. The ancient civilizations believed that the morning star and evening star were two distinct and extremely bright stars. However, the early Greek astronomers who studied the heavens realized that the morning star and evening star weren't stars at all. These two objects moved with respect to the background stars. By plotting their motion, the Greek astronomers deduced that the morning star and evening star were the same object, a planet we call Venus. This simulation was run using the Stellarium planetarium software. It was run for an area in rural England. If you look carefully on the left, you can see the pre-dawn glow of the sky as twilight is coming to an end. What this clearly shows is that Venus is by far the brightest object in the pre-dawn sky. At its brightest, Venus is 20 times brighter than Sirius, the dog star, which is the brightest star in the sky, 12 times brighter than Mars, and is six times brighter than Jupiter, the next brightest planet to Venus. The brightness of Venus sometimes means it can be mistaken for a UFO. Indeed, back in 1973, no less a person than future US President Jimmy Carter claimed he'd seen a UFO four years earlier when he was going to a meeting of the Lions Club in Leary, Georgia. Although his report was filed with the date of October 1969, later analysis showed the meeting couldn't have taken place in October and must have actually taken place on 6th of January of that year at 7.15. At this time, Venus was in the exact position in the sky where Carter claimed he'd seen the UFO. Because Venus is a planet, it doesn't emit any visible light of its own like a star does. Planets shine by reflecting starlight from the star they orbit, which in case of Venus is obviously the Sun. The brightness of a planet, or in fact any object which shines by reflecting light, is determined by a combination of three different factors. The first one is the planet's distance from the Sun. This is because the intensity of sunlight falling on the planet diminishes as the square of its distance. This is the well-known inverse square law, which many of you have studied in high school science lessons. Clearly, the more radiation on a planet, the brighter it is, all other factors being equal. So if we compare Venus to Mars, then Venus is on average 2.1 times closer to the sun than Mars. So it receives 4.4, which is 2.1 squared, times as much sunlight per unit area. The second factor is the proportion of sunlight hitting the planet which is reflected back into space. This is known as the albedo and has a value between 0 and 1. An albedo of 0 means the planet reflects no sunlight back. Such a planet would be totally black and actually invisible. Clearly no such bodies exist, but a hypothetical planet completely covered in soot would have an albedo of only 0 0.04, meaning only 4% of the sunlight would be reflected back. At the other end of the scale, an albedo of 1 means all the sunlight hitting is reflected back. Although no bodies exist with an albedo of 1, a planet completely covered in fresh snow would have an albedo of 0.9. The albedo of Venus at 0.77 is higher than any other planet in the solar system. For example, Mars has an albedo of only 0.25.
The third factor is how large the illuminated part of the planet appears in the sky. And this depends itself on three different things. Obviously, the diameter of the planet, its distance from Earth, but also its phase. That's a percentage of the sunlit phase, which you can see from the Earth. Both the distance from the Earth and the phase are continually changing as the planet and the Earth go around the sun in their respective orbits. If we look at Venus, Mars and Jupiter, the three brightest planets in the solar system, we see that Venus is considerably closer to the sun than the other two and reflects more light back, higher albedo. However, Jupiter is by far the largest planet, but is also considerably further away from the sun than the other two. The interesting thing is phase. Both Mars and Jupiter are the brightest at 100% phase, whereas Venus, it's um, only 26% for reasons I'll explain later. So putting together um, 3A, B and C, we see the area in the sky where the planet is brightest is considerably larger for Jupiter than both Venus and Mars. These figures are in square arc seconds. One arc second is roughly one two thousandth the diameter of the moon. So putting this all together, we see that um, Venus is 20 times the brightness of Sirius, um, Mars 1.7 and Jupiter 3.2. Um, and I've also put the magnitude scales there. Magnitude is a scale astronomers use where the lower the number, the brighter the object. This simple animation shows Venus and the Earth in their orbits around the Sun. Venus is closer to the Sun and orbits once every 224.7 days compared to the Earth's 365 and a quarter days. This means every 584 days um, Venus gains a lap on the Earth. This is called its synodic period. If we look from the viewpoint of the Earth, then Venus appears to orbit the Sun every 584 days. So start with the point where from the Earth, Venus is closest to the Sun. We call this inferior conjunction. At this point, Venus is lost in the Sun's glare. It's very hard to see. Over the next few weeks, Venus appears to move away from the Sun in the sky, rises earlier, becomes visible in the morning as the morning star. Roughly two months after inferior conjunction, Venus is at its furthest apparent position in the sky from the Sun. We call this the greatest elongation and Venus typically rises two to three hours before the Sun at high latitudes. After this, Venus then appears to move closer to the Sun and nine and a half months after inferior conjunction, it reaches superior conjunction where once again it's lost in the Sun's glare. After superior conjunction, Venus moves away from the Sun and is now visible in the western sky after sunset as the evening star. It reaches greatest elongation again, where it typically then sets two to three hours after the sun. After reaching greatest elongation, it moves closer to the sun and returns back to inferior conjunction, five, eight, four days later. One um, point to make is that Venus is never further than 45 degrees from the sun, which means for most of the time, it's a daytime object. As you can see here, um, Venus's orbit is tilted with respect to the Earth's. This means that in inferior conjunction, Venus passes either just below the Sun or just above it. It's only on a rare occasion that Venus passes directly in front of the Sun, in which case we have a transit. So if you look at Venus through a telescope over 584 days, it appears to go through a set of phases just like the Moon. You can't see the phases with the naked eye because Venus is just too small, it's only a dot. At inferior conjunction, when Venus is between the Earth and the Sun, the sunlit part of Venus faces away from us, so we have a new Venus. Over time, Venus gradually gets more and more illuminated, 
waxes through to a crescent phase, to a half Venus at the greatest elongation, to a full Venus at superior conjunction, when the whole of the Earth's facing side is illuminated. It then gets smaller, wanes back to a half Venus, then to a crescent, and finally back to a new Venus. Because the distance between the Earth and Venus varies a great deal, the apparent size of Venus varies too. At its full Venus, when it's lost in the glare of the Sun, it's actually six times smaller in diameter than at inferior conjunction when it's closest to Earth. At inferior conjunction, actually, it's the faintest because most of the sunlit part of the planet is facing away from us. It's actually at its brightest at 26% phase. The first person to discover the phases of Venus was Galileo. In his time, the teaching of the Catholic Church favoured geocentrism. That's the view the Earth is the centre of the universe and everything goes around it. Indeed, certain verses of the Bible could be interpreted as supporting that viewpoint. However, the phases of Venus and the way it appears smaller when it is a full Venus only really work if Venus orbits the Sun. Therefore, Galileo concluded that the geocentric theory must be wrong. Unfortunately for Galileo, in 1616, the church declared heliocentrism to be heresy. Heliocentric books were banned and Galileo was ordered to refrain from holding, teaching or defending heliocentric ideas. The Roman Inquisition tried Galileo in 1633 and found him vehemently suspect of heresy. He was sentenced to indefinite imprisonment and kept under house arrest until he died in 1642. However, you can't argue with the facts. When you look through a telescope, Venus does show changes in size and phase, which only really work if the heliocentric model is correct. So eventually, in 1758, more than 100 years later, the church relented and accepted the heliocentric view. The reason why we can't see any details on Venus is because it's completely covered in thick cloud. So despite being the closest astronomical object to Earth, other than the Moon, little was known about Venus until the 60s. Without any surface markings to follow, its rotation period wasn't known until 1961, when astronomers bounced radar signals off the planet and studied their echoes. It wasn't until the planet was visited by spacecraft in the 1960s that we knew just how hostile an environment it is. It turns out the surface temperature is 460 degrees Celsius, hot enough to melt lead, and the atmospheric pressure at the surface is a crushing 92 atmospheres. The bright clouds we see turned out to be made of sulfuric acid. 